be DC to order. 729. Oh, it's not time. 731. My phone at 731. So quick. And that, oh, is it working now? Yes. Your mini. You're right, 731. Weeks it was not working. Okay, so let's call the meeting of the CPDC for November 4th to order. And let's see, first order of business, we have a, an application continued for what, a special home occupation? Yes, so I gave you the legal ad, so it would be best to open the hearing and then continue it. Okay. There is no written continuance, but we did agree verbally. Back yep. and forth were for naught, Julie. Well, I told you, we're not discussing it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they um, I was ready. <laughs> a notice of public hearing. Notice is hereby given. The pursuant to sections 4.3, 5.3, and 5.6.7 of the Town of Reading Zoning Bylaw, and in accordance with MGL Chapter 40A, Section 9, Community Planning and Development Commission will hold a public hearing on November. Monday, November 4th, 2019 at 7.30 p.m. in the Select Board's meeting room at Reading Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street, to consider the application for a special permit to allow a special home occupation in the existing garage behind the property located at 2123 Village Street, Assessor's Map 17, Lot 141 in Reading, Massachusetts. A copy of the application and associated documents are available to the public in the Public Services Department in Town Hall on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., and on Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. Now we have a request from the applicant to continue to December 9th, 2019. Uh, it says here that it was an incomplete application. It wasn't so far as incomplete, but after delving into it, we just needed a lot more info while looking at the garage and the lots than who had rights and who didn't, so okay. we just needed more information. Okay, so can I have a, a motion to continue that to December 9th at oh. the time? You can do that for 745. Motion to continue to 745 on December 9th. Second. All in favor? Three zero. <coughs> now another continuance for 135, 139, 149 R Howard Street. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Sorry. Yeah. Do you need to wait to 8 p.m. for that continuance? It's already continued to this, right? You can re-announce it if anyone comes or anyone. Okay. Do it now and then Take do it, it again. Order, yeah. <coughs> Okay, when do you want to continue that to December 9th as well? Again, 8, 8 o'clock? Or do we want to go sooner? Um, 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock, yeah. Okay. We have a motion for that. Motion. Motion. Oh. motion to continue the public hearing for definitive subdivision plan 135, 139, and 149 Howard Street to December 9th. At 8 p.m. At 8 p.m. At 8 p.m. Second. All in favor? And then one more continuance here. Uh, we get a motion to continue the 258, 262 Main Street site plan review. Where else is this today? Um, motion, to motion to continue the public hearing site plan review for two. 58-262 Main Street, Reading CRE Ventures LLC, continued to December 9th, 2019 There's a few things. Um, the presentations for town meeting, which opens next Tuesday, the 12th. 
um, are ready, we can go through those and you guys can give me your feedback. Um, <clears throat> those first? And uh, we're not going back in time. I just forgot, literally forgot to change the first slide. Um, <coughs> so that's a note. Should I switch them? Maybe that would be easier, yeah. yeah. <coughs> that was pre baby. <laughs> that time there. Things change, we're still discussing the same stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, here, I think are these are. Thank you. Better. Okay, so. Um, the first presentation is on the definitions of marijuana and hemp, and actually town council will be giving this presentation, but I put it together. It's Article 13. Basically, I just um, started with the proposal, why we're changing it, and then the outcome if it's adopted and the outcome if it's not adopted. And basically the proposal is to adopt the Chapter 94G definitions of marijuana and hemp. Um, and then... I show that the definition of marijuana, which exists, which is to be deleted, um, hemp is not currently defined in our bylaw, and then the next page is the chapter 94 definition of marijuana, in case anyone's wondering what that is, it's not actually in the warrant, so, and then the chapter 94 definition of hemp. And then I just end again with what happens um, if it's adopted or if it isn't adopted. I thought I heard something about the Department of Agriculture coming up with some rules now to allow people to start? Yeah, so we discussed those. They came out, I think, in September. Yeah. MDAR, there might be updates or new rules, um, but they came out with a policy initiative um, and basically divided um, <clears throat> hemp products into two different categories, and so some are authorized for sale and then some are not. Most of the ones that are not include CBD and are products that you actually physically consume. Um, so what we're talking about here specifically relates to marijuana and hemp in zoning. So separating out, right, right now our definition of marijuana includes all parts of the plant. So as Tony pointed out actually a number of months ago, um, right now in town we don't allow any parts of the marijuana plant, so we don't allow any products with hemp. Um, separating them into their own definitions will enable them to be regulated in zoning separately. It's really up to the Board of Health to decide how it wants to um, come down on the MDAR policy statement. But So we're just dealing with zoning. Okay, so specifically <coughs> what's happening with zoning? We're just going to add to, remove one definition and add the other one? So. There's two things, that's one of them. So the definition of marijuana gets removed and we replace it with the chapter 94G definition, which actually includes um, another strain of marijuana category. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, um, so, th so there's a couple different types of the cannabis plant and like our definition right now only actually includes one of them. Mm -hmm. And there are two mm -hmm. big ones where hemp, can, hemp and marijuana yeah. products come from. So. Um, it, it just it cleans it up and it puts it in line with the state definition. So if the state has regulations that are promulgated related to marijuana, we can more easily adopt them if we want to and be in line with them. And then it adds a definition of hemp, which stands on its own. So um, that enables us to regulate hemp in zo if we wanted to in zoning differently than, than we could regulate marijuana. Like where right now they're lumped together, so we prohibit. So we're still going to have our own definitions. It's not going to be, as per state MGL 94, marijuana is this, as per state MGL No, I think that's exactly what it's going to be. Okay. Yeah. So basically we're going to reference nine, chapter 94G, mm -hmm. Mass General Laws, for these definitions. Got that on all your slides, too. That's good. Um, So if it's, if it's adopted, then like I mentioned, the regulations, our current regulations and zoning for marijuana don't change. Like we don't allow retail marijuana anywhere and we only allow um, medical marijuana in the industrial zoning district. That won't change. Um, what we will be able to do is decide if we want to regulate hemp in zoning differently. Okay, so this is step one and then there's a step two to regulate it or? This is just step one. It's just definitions. So the two the two parts are marijuana and hemp. 
Right. So right now they're combined into one definition, which is flawed. Yeah. We're going to separate them into two definitions in line with the state definitions. Okay. We have no proposed regulations for hemp because I see that personally as something the Board of Health has to figure out. Okay. So if, there, if this is not adopted, then mm -hmm. we keep what we have, which prohibits all parts of the plant cannabis sativa anywhere in town, mm -hmm. which means that then we really do need to take zoning enforcement on CBD products. Okay. All CBD products, like regardless of the MDAR policy statement. Yep. Um, so. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Not perhaps within this purview, has anybody spoken to the owner of the CBD store to see if they would like to present to the town at town meeting? I, that is not my role. Okay. Um, no, no, that's fine. We haven't, have you, have they come in? Um, but that's a good question. I can run that by town council tomorrow. And, and talk also to the nature store would need to be included. I mean, there are a number right. of stores in town that sell products yeah. with CBD in them. Um, the products they claim have CBD. Sorry? The products they claim have CBD. Mm -hmm. That's the regulatory Jack the issue. price up. <laughs> yeah, like no one knows. It's not regulated. Right. Not, not to that level. So... And I haven't seen it, like I've noticed in the stores I go to closer to where I live, like the products are still on the shelves. Um, so regardless of that policy statement from the Department of Agriculture, towns are just, stores are doing what they do, towns are doing different things or nothing. Um, so that's that one and um, my understanding is town council is actually gonna present it. And who is reading the um, the vote from CPDC? Um, For all of these, really I good. You bring up great questions, Dwayne. Um, do you want to? Well, I'll be there, so I might as well. Okay, you can. I think you're the only town meeting member there. Well, unless you're, you're no. town meeting? No. It's that doesn't mean you can't be there. It is open. You have to come all the way from the way back. Remind me not to run for town count, town meeting anymore. But anyway. You don't have to run. You just, you just show up at the meeting, have them sign a piece of paper. At our district, anyways. That's what I did the last time because it turned out I was supposed to run. I'm just going to write down your two questions. Um, and we did take a vote on this, right? July or August. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and then, so Tony, you will read the CBDC report. Yeah. <clears throat> On July 15, 2019, CBDC voted for zero against whatever the numbers were. <clears throat> but that's why I'm going to you. I'm going, I have no idea what the numbers are supposed to be. So, if you think that one's complicated, I actually think that one is. Well, I never really think about it much because I'm like... The board vote um, write-up will be presented. We'll be right. there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I already have them. I did them months ago. I mean, okay. it's like very... April, apparently. <laughs> so, um, Article 14 relates to footnote 1. So if you think CPD is complicated now, getting into footnote 1, which is, no, I think, far more complicated. Um, so footnote one to the tables of uses, as you might remember, um, is the footnote that allows single family homes to be altered to two family homes um, by right if certain conditions are met. So here again, what it is, what's the proposal? So the specific proposal that we're at the town meeting will be entertaining is to allow it by special permit from the ZBA and add clarity to parameters for conversion. Um, and then in the tables, we remove it and, and or adjust it as needed. Why are we changing it? Um, because interpretation and administration of the current bylaw is presenting challenges for staff and applicants. Outcome if adopted, the zoning board will make decisions on footnote one cases. Um, and there are other outcomes, but that's, that's the big one, I think. Um, 
Well, the ZBA is currently making decisions. Oh, no, its staff is making decisions, and then they're going to the ZBA because they don't like the decision the staff is making. That's correct. So. Um, That's not the only outcome, though, right? No, it's not the only outcome, and I could expand upon that, but I thought that... Um, Kind of the biggest that they'd have to go through a special permit so process. That's an easy one to kind of summarize, whereas the other ones are a little more complicated, and mm -hmm. I get into that. So there are, so you could lead off. I think Tony, did you agree to present this one? Yes, but I thought five minutes ago we agreed you were doing them, but I will do it. No, I'm not. No, I, I'm, I'm going to do, no. We okay. did not agree that I was doing all of them. Um, yeah, so Tony, you agreed to this one. So basically, you, that could be like your segue. Yes. That's one of the outcomes. There are other outcomes, and then, um, I mean, no, that's not a, maybe not a good segue, but basically, so the first thing I did is I put that it removes footnote one entirely from table 531, um, which is the table of uses in business and industrial districts, um, because it's redundant. Just realized I'm, I don't have this in slideshow mode. That makes it a little easier to read, right? Okay. Um, so, and here it shows in red, and it's crossed off that it's getting removed from that table. Mm -hmm. um, it's too bad it's not going to be that clear with the projector at town meeting. It's just so fuzzy, and everybody's so far away from it. That <laughs> little tiny red. I can sh I can make that more obvious. Yeah, maybe highlight. Can you put a highlight yeah, bubble? I can highlight it. Yeah. And did we change? That's the only thing we're changing right there. Mm -hmm. uh, this is PowerPoint, correct? Yeah. You could point to it or something. You have a. a you could have something fly in, whatever. Just make just it yellow. Did you <coughs> see that? No, no. Do a zoom. Copy that, make it nice and big, and then do a zoom over. So you'll have the background, and, boom, and the picture can be two thirds, three quarters of the size. That's, That's a good idea. I can do that. Okay. Whatever, just so that it's visible. Because the stuff um, and also, visible. I just realized the table is like, wonky. And no, I haven't done projection. one of these, but would we have to show footnote two becoming footnote one and so on? Um, yeah. So. <clears throat> Wait, we, we're we removing footnote one entirely from the table. Right. And, and then, then all the other footnotes get adjusted. Okay. Um, so can we just say that right there? Right. Yeah, so and that's what I did, and I think that's the way it is in the warrant. Um, but I wonder if it's not correct in the warrant. Oh, they don't. So they don't put the table in the warrant at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that. For Is it in a supplemental packet? Um, I'm just letting you know that every time something like this happens, town meeting members who don't do any of their homework are going to be pissed off that you didn't send them their packet ahead of time so they could do their homework, even though they wouldn't have done. Well, their they homework. get the warrant ahead of time, and I think the it's warrant. It's not in the warrant. You're saying. No, so the, the actual table showing the footnote is not in the warrant. We could do a handout that they could pick up at town meeting. Okay, we you still might get some grief. You might get some grief, though. But, so, but the, I will say, on the flip side, when we prepare, prepare two different documents that people do get in advance, we actually get grief because they might not match perfectly, yep. as has happened at many other town meetings where there's yep. like a small typo, and then that ends up derailing the whole town meeting yep. for many, many minutes when we are standing there like dumbfounded can't figure out why. So I think it's, I hear what you're saying, but there's challenges any way you do it. Um, but I will fix that. You can yell at them <coughs> if they start getting all confused. Say, you can't follow this. Here's what we're doing. We're taking this little note away. I'm not going to yell at anybody. You want me to do it? Um, no. I'll show up for that. <laughs> So, and the second um, piece of the table that's getting fixed is that we're actually moving footnote one from yes to no, to from single family yes to two family no, um, and it's also not going to be very clear, so I'll have to look at that one too, um, because that's a more appropriate place for the footnote. So this is in the table of uses for residential districts. See, I think this would be a good one for you to present, Tony. <clears throat> and then I can just be there as backup because I'm already like tripping over it. Um, and then here is how footnote one is getting revised. Um, so, 
So, I might rethink this whole presentation, actually. What to do from and to, to the just image? make it really clear, like what's going on. Like I'd leave the text and then say like rationale or um, what the of the effect of the change is. Um, unless you think that having it this way is okay. I think this way is okay. Keep it very simple. Okay. This is what it's going to say. If people have questions about well, why is this? Why is that? We can answer those questions. When you get into the too much detail of why you're doing it to start with, then they start questioning it. Let them come to you and shoot them, I mean, answer your responses. It is a fine balance. It is a fine balance. Um, but yeah. this one is, is really very simple. Basically, we're just cleaning up uh, a generic, hey, here's something that you can do. And people started trying to take advantage of it six ways to Sunday. So congratulations, we now need to have <laughs> actual physical text to say this is exactly your parameters and then it'll be so um it'll be negotiated by the zoning board through the special permit process which will require a public hearing and notification to neighbors which is important when you have a potential you know change of use happening that could change the character of a neighborhood right um and that's all actually in the background in the warrant. Mm -hmm. I like wrote all that. That's like in there. Yeah. So that's kind of like what the presentation is, mm -hmm. is just reading the background. This is fortuitous in that there's basically two things you're doing. You're removing one word, altered, and you're adding additional text. It's not one of those, well, we're moving the text from here over here, and this is this. this is, no. It's basically just here's the additional so that everybody is clear on what the rules are. And then there's one more paragraph that we added, which is, you know, kind of the, the cap on total um, relates to the cap on total additional square footage. Now, this isn't the cap. This is basically saying that you kill the building, you kill your right. Right, so, but it relates back to that, that you can expand it to a certain cap and then beyond that, forget it, yeah. and nothing else. But you'll put the exceptions category in there. What are the exceptions, Pam? When the, this is what we discussed before, when, the, when involuntary damage to the property, like a fire, occurs, all bets are off. So you that would off. be something that we would keep like up our sleeves. So if someone says, why is the word voluntarily in? Then we explain the difference between right. voluntary demolition and involuntary demolition, and involuntary demolition has different uh, rights that come with it. Um, I just would think if somebody were to see that text for the first time, they'd have a knee-jerk reaction to it. Yeah. Can you explain it. That's terrible. yeah, and they're they're I, do you, um, there there usually are like a number of questions that happen at town meeting okay. and a Q and A that happens. Okay. Um, that's something I'm I'm happy to answer. Okay, good. Um, but yeah, it is kind of a f striking a balance between too much information, which leads to like rabbit hole conversations, right. and like just the right amount so people kind of know what's going on and know th know what they don't know and know what to ask. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so that's that. And just let me state for the record, we're not here to keep anybody in the dark. No, totally not. It's just that. You get into details and it goes on forever. Exactly. So I spent a lot more time on Article 15 and Article 16, which are the mixed use and intensity regulations mm -hmm. presentations. Um, so Article 15 is mixed use and it ha includes changes to sections two and sections and section five. Um, and so there are three components to the mixed use. Um, Zoning bylaw amendment, one is defining mixed use and clarifying when it's applicable. The second is adding mixed use to the table of uses and identifying a process for it. And then the third is establishing regulations for it. So I've broken down into three categories. Um, and then I just kind of go through like exactly what's in the warrant. Um, the definition of mixed use is um, and clarifying applicability. Basically this paragraph at the bottom clarifies that it's, um, it really is, it, it's applicable when 
um, there's a residential component to a mixed-use project. So then the second, adding mixed use and identifying the process. So here it is added to the table um, of uses, and then the process is highlighted in um, yellow, and it's a special permit process, which is a special permit from CPDC, um, and it's allowed only in the Business A and Business C zoning districts. And again, like I can go into how the special permit process, it, we, we feel the special permit process is most appropriate for something like this, and it does require a butter notification and a public hearing. Um, and then I show where business A is in town in case people aren't familiar with it. So the, it's kind of all over. The main you know, area is right along South what Main Street. Those big red horizontal lines. So those are arrows. Is it not clear? Not at all. You need a bigger arrow head. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's pointing to an, uh, um, mix, a business A zoning district. Which would be the um, mobile station off of West Street, I believe, at that point. Yeah, it's, so I would say that, that it's in the very light green. Um, <coughs> there's one in the center of town, like where the fire station and the gas station are, and then one over here in the western part of town. Uh, where the mobile station is, and then there's one up in the northern part of town where Home Goods is, and the big corridor is along south, uh, flanking both sides of South Main Street. And then I zoom in to show where Business C is, and that Business C is almost entirely built out by Reading Woods and is not the intent or the focus of the zoning changes. Isn't there another strip of C somewhere? I don't know about I believe it's on the other side of the highway, that little gray area. No, on the last um, slide, where you're looking at um, Redding Woods. Yeah. You see that gray area underneath on the other side of the highway? The little triangle? Yeah. Yeah. Business C is um, shown in the I always thought it was only that, but then I, I thought someone kept saying that there was something else. I believe this is also Redding. That's industrial. Oh, that's industrial, okay. Yeah. That is also Reading, but it's industrial. Yeah. That is one of the districts where we allow medical marijuana. <laughs> um, I do not know of any other business C, but I will double check. Okay, just in case. Oh, so the the real estate building yeah. is in C. And really that that's probably the only possible opportunity. Yeah. The real estate building and then inside the clover relief, which I think is owned by the state. Yeah, but they're using it as their staging. And they'll use it as staging, they're on, um, at least in the foreseeable future. Yeah. Um, that's not going to change. <laughs> um, so, part three, establishing regulations for mixed use. Um, so, this is just the general statement about uses being combined either horizontally or vertically within the same building or within separate buildings if you allow it. Um, and then I mentioned that you know mixed use projects along South Main Street need to comply with the South Main Street design best practices as much as possible. And again, I state the process, which is that you by special permit can authorize a mixed use project within business A or business C provided that certain requirements are met, and then I launch into the different sections, um, subsections of the regulations for mixed use. So we have dimensional requirements, com the commercial component, residential component, parking, loading, curb cuts and driveways, and waivers. Are these the quote unquote following requirements? They're the following requirements that are broken into these categories, and now I'm gonna go through them. Okay, just cause that has a semicolon on it, somebody might think that they need to correct the grammar for the wording. Right here? Yeah. So that's the way it is in the text, Because I believe. Because after this, in the text, follows a list. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's so okay. it's actually, yeah, no, you're right. It's not 100% correct. Um, 
So if you've removed like this bold part along the, the, the bold heading of this, and then you added all the text into each of these categories, then it would be correct. If it's correct the way it's written, it will be written. That's okay. Don't let somebody change your grammar on you. They'll, they'll do that sometimes. Right, so it's correct in the warrant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. And I just broke it out for presentation's sake. Okay. So these are the categories, the considerations that were, the things that were considered when we drafted the regulations for mixed use. So um, under dimensional requirements, um, <clears throat> we talk about the corner lot allowing a zero setback. And I put that the rationale for that is that it locates the building at the street and enhances the pedestrian interface. And that a, so in general, I should, should have started, I'm getting ahead of myself. In general, the intensity regulations of section six and the dimensional regulations of table 6.3 apply to mixed use with the following exceptions. Um, and so one exception is that a corner lot allows a zero setback from both streets and that, and then the second one is that a mixed use project with a permanent shared parking arrangement um, with any abutting property may have a zero foot setback from said abutting property. And in, with this, I'm really envisioning like a shared parking agreement with a neighboring property that's also in business A or that's along, along Main Street. I suppose it is possible that someone could have a shared parking arrangement with like their residential neighborship every year, but that would be like a whole nother That'd be questionable variance. because yeah, you'd need that, to. There, there would be a lot of stuff that would be baked into that. So right. um, if that question comes up, I mm -hmm. can address that. Um, but the vision for this really was a, the properties that front on Main Street. Okay, and so what's important here is that it may have a zero setback. We're not forcing a zero setback. We would look at things like sight line clearances for traffic. We'd look at opportunities for landscaping because remember Mary Ellen's point was that the zero setbacks in downtown, for example, don't allow for landscaping. Right. So we would weigh that out. Right, yeah. that's correct. Zero setback here allows for more landscaping there or better arrangement. It's not mandatory. It's just, and it's it's intended to incentivize shared parking because it can add a little flexibility to the overall building envelope if that's something that is needed. Um, better opportunity for making the parking work, potentially smaller parking area if they're sharing it, which would lead to more landscaping. Right. More better landscaping, so we would right. look at all of that. Right, and then also the other thing about May is that that neighboring property might be like, yeah, we'll have a shared parking agreement, but I still want your building to be meeting setbacks. I mean, so it, it's also part of the conversation is, is mm -hmm. with that neighboring property owner, so. Um, Then we talk about the commercial component. So I stated the exact language that's in the warrant. Um, and then I was reading it and I was thinking, do I remember how this works? We tried to do this math on the fly, if you remember. I remember we talked about it a few times. And I, I feel like the way it's worded, it can be interpreted both ways. So when you net the spaces out, um, so I wanted to, without saying, without leading the witness, I wanted you to remind me, how does this work? So we always wanted 25% and I believe you got some feedback from developers telling you that that was too much. Right. But the intent really is, if you're talking about a four story building, that the first floor is commercial. Right? At least. And so we started trying to figure out, well, if you, ex if you exclude those areas that belong to the entire building, are you really getting back down to the percentage that they, that they say is feasible financially without giving everything away? And we do not want to give away the commercial portion of this. So you're saying, take the gross floor area, net out spaces for access, circulation, egress, mechanicals, and utilities, and then take 25% of what's left. That's how I read that. Right. And is that how this reads to you? 
We thought that was fair. Yes, I agree that that's the more fair way to do it, I think. Now, okay, this assumes This assumes a multi-story building, multi-story mixed-use building, and so that there would have to be some common areas dedicated to accessing those upper floors. Obviously, if somebody were doing a um, separate multi-building um, development, because we, we, we might allow that, mm -hmm. right? We might allow a commercial building and a residential building. Mm -hmm. right. This wouldn't apply because that entire commercial building would be commercial, right. but it's, we'd have to gross out all the floors and say that that building equals 25%. I think you'd look at the project total, right? You'd look at the square footage as yeah. like total. So whether it's one building or multiple buildings and you'd, let me think. So would you net out all the spaces for access, circulation, egress, mechanics, and utilities from the residential building and the commercial building and then take 25% of what's left? I would take the excluded areas from both commercial and residential, calculate what you have for a gross floor area, and say 25% of that must be commercial. Yeah, whether it's one building or multiple buildings. One building or multiple buildings. Yeah. Okay, that's, I agree. Right, okay. That way it's, it's like the, um, what do they call it? The um, indifference factor, right? So like if you had a really big property, mm -hmm. a developer could slice it up into different buildings or put them in one building and there's no, there's not really, a, there's not a penalty for doing it one way versus the other. Right. So you can't put, you can't put one little store in front and two large apartment buildings in the back. And remember, he can go over that 25% without a problem. Right. So if he does a building with a house in the back, that's fine too. But we're saying 25% has to be dedicated. And I will add, I did find two examples of a higher percentage of commercial required, though I haven't been able to dig into if projects have been approved under those regulations or not, but found one of 33% requirement and one of a 50%. What was the town with the fifty percent? I believe it was Maynard. Was it Maynard? I think so. So I can send those to you, um, but I also have to look more into it as well. Well, and that actually gets at a question that I have to post to you towards the end of the pre this presentation. Um, but. So thank you. That is actually the way I read it too. I just wanted to make sure because I could see it being interpreted the other way as well. Um, so I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So when I'm like answering a question at town meeting, you're not all like, no, no, that's not what we meant. Um, and then I put the rationale for this um, is that it requires a healthy commercial component in order to honor the Main Street commercial corridor. And then down here with me, I put a star in front of it because it's actually, um, unfortunately, in the warrant, it's not B, it, like it should be. Right. Um, so it's to correct the clerical error. Um, and so this is another aspect of the commercial component is that if it provides space for existing commercial tenants and can maintain current viable businesses post-development, it'll be given favorable consideration on requests for waivers, dimensional or otherwise. Um, and the rationale for that is that existing businesses play a key role in the vitality of town and should be accommodated wherever possible. Okay, so you're going to need a friendly amendment. Oh, I didn't put them at the rationale, but I like where where are you? That reads like a sentence, doesn't it? No. Which, no, which I would one? capitalize the word 
existing. And then I'll have to do it for all the rationale. And that's fine. I can right. do it for all. Right. That's fine. Right. 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 Um, so you're saying that in the warrant there is no B that we need to add the B, correct? Yeah. So you need a friendly amendment at the beginning to say please add the B. Yeah, and there's a couple more. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's how it needs to be done. Though I do recall in the past that they've made changes to the warrant without the friendly amendment actually being required. Yeah, so the... really super clerical things like this mm -hmm. can be, I think, can be done without the friendly amendment. Um, but I'll verify that. Okay. I think that what they've done is they've done a handout and say, yes, your warrant is incorrect. Here's the actual. That's <coughs> true. Residential component, there, oh, this is weird. How the A and the B are, or whatever. I was talking about that earlier today. Um, so, two of the provisions here are um, the portion of a mixed use project that fronts on Main Street. Residential units shall be located at the rear or on upper floors only. The rationale for that is that it honors the Main Street commercial corridor and the pedestrian interface. And then another one is about the affordable component. And um, with this, you know, really these line up with, it's in alignment with um, HUD and complement that are determined annually. Fractional numbers in affordable housing are always rounded up, so that's nothing new. Um, and then the third one, which is that you can waive or allow flexibility for dimensional requirements of section six or table 6.3 if a project provides deeper or broader affordability. So 50% area median income or 15% or more of units um, versus 10%. And the rationale for having inclusionary zoning is that it helps us stay on pace with state requirements. Um, and then this specific provision incentivizes broader and or deeper affordability. Why have a residential piece at all? Sorry? Why have a residential piece at all? Why not just do commercial? Why do we need more residential? So, that's a great question, town meeting member Safina. Thank you for asking. Hmm. Um, I just have an answer ready for that. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm not like I'm not feeling so great today, and I'm not on yeah. top of my game. But yeah, we'll keep you long. But that, um, that question's going to get asked, and it's legitimate. Like, why do we need more residential? We just we can't get them to build this commercial stuff at all. Mm -hmm. So if we mix it, blend it, maybe. Yeah, and I would rather I want to have an answer that like really gets at economic development and um, viability of projects, things like that. Like, so I'll get an answer put together. Parking. So here's where I added in the word space, which I left out. Um, and that, so that's a friendly amendment right there in red. I put it in two places. Um, so parking for residential is a minimum ratio of 1.25 spaces per unit. The rationale for that is that it, um, like, the reason it's not 1.5 or higher is because we're trying to right size parking in town based on recent studies of utilization. Um, and this 1.25 aligns with the 40R residential parking requirement in downtown. Parking for commercials shall be provided at a minimum ratio of one space per 300 square feet. Um, shared parking arrangements between sites are encouraged for commercial uses. The rationale here is Main Street is still an auto-oriented corridor. Parking is needed for the viability of commercial space. Um, so there are, I should say, there are actually six provisions here. So these are just the first three, and then the next slide has the second three. Um, so provision C, up to 30% of the total required parking spaces for mixed use may be striped and marked as compact spaces, which we define as eight, or are commonly defined as eight feet by 16 feet. And the rationale is it's common industry practice, and it often enables more spaces to fit on a site. 
It was a standard parking space normally? Um, eight and a half or nine by 18 or 20. That, that's probably one of the questions they'll come up with. Yeah, I can answer that. <laughs> like I just did. Good. Um, sometimes they're actually even 10 feet wide. Okay. So, <clears throat> the, the next three parking provisions. Provision D, a comprehensive parking plan shall be submitted. Um, blah, blah, blah. This requires proof that the parking layout and count will work as designed and be managed for all uses on the site. E, bicycle parking shall be provided in any residential parking garage and on site for commercial uses. This accommodates bicyclists and may alleviate vehicular parking demand, especially for commercial uses. Um, well, I guess it could be for either, but I would say on the main street corridor, it's probably not going to take away the demand for spaces for residential. Um, and F, a mixed use project that provides one or more EV stations, car sharing spaces, spaces for app rides, gets favorable consideration on requests for waivers. And this incentivizes accommodations for other vehicular transit options. So that's parking. Loading. So these loading um, provisions all kind of get at two things. Loading needs to be managed on site and shall contemplate all different types of deliveries. So residential deliveries, commercial deliveries, Amazon deliveries, um, move-ins. So um, that's the rationale behind this. Curb cuts and driveways. <coughs> so and here we we're trying to encourage limiting the number and length of curb cuts on Main Street. Um, and the two ways to do that are actually just to say, please strive to limit the number and length of curb cuts on Main Street, and then also um, attempt to provide a future driveway connection to an adjacent parcel if possible. And that's incentivized by favorable consideration on waivers. And I see this as, um, helping improve safety for pedestrians and vehicles along the corridor, just reducing the overall number of turning movements, curb cuts. Um, and then waivers. So um, the CPDC may consider, as, as noted throughout the whole, all of the regulations, there are many instances where um, certain things are incentivized by allowing flexibility and the potential for waivers from other things. So here, I just sort of summarize it that you can consider waiving dimensional and or other requirements from sections 5, 6, 8, which are the regulations, section 6, which are the intensity regulations, and table 6.3, which are the dimensional regulations to promote design flexibility, achieve appropriate density, affordability, mix of uses, or design quality. And then we have a statement that the provisions of sections 5682 and 5683 shall not be waived. So 5682 is commercial and 5683 is the affordable component of residential. So I wanted to see how you would feel about um, taking away your, like right now you would not have the ability to if a commercial, if a mixed use project came in with 22% commercial and you loved everything about it, you couldn't approve it because you can't waive the commercial component. So I, I, we can't waive it, but they could get a variance, correct? Yeah, I mean, variances are always a possibility. Because for us to love it, really, we want the 25%. Well, but what if, but you don't know because you haven't seen any, right? So, like, I'm just, I'm just feeling like this might end up being, so we're not explicitly saying in the commercial component mm -hmm. that they can get a waiver from it, but we're just, we're sneakily taking it out from the very last piece of the article. We're taking this out so that you're not stuck. Like, we're not broadcasting that you can get a waiver from it, but we're not limiting your ability to grant a waiver if you loved a project and only the math worked out to 24%. Okay. 
What's in five, six, eight, two? Is it just the percentage or the entire commercial section? It's the whole commercial section. But really, that's like the meat and potatoes. <clears throat> I would prefer, at least for the first go around, to leave in the requirement for the minimum of 25% commercial. The goal is to keep the uh, area a commercial area. What we're hoping to do is to incentivize them to put commercial in, and as a bonus, you get the residential. And if you are pushing 22 or 24%, there's something we can do to bring it down a little bit to get to the 25, I'm certain. I just don't think we'll see 22. I think you'll start seeing 18s and 15s, which, you know, this board would probably reject, but what's a future board once they have leeway? What's that going to happen? What's going to happen there? And what if three years goes by and you get no projects? And we keep hearing from developers that 25% is too high. Right, but are they actually proposing 24% or are they really looking at 15%? Right? So they'll say no because they say 25 is too high, but do they think 22 is too high? Yes. Well, so it, so it won't matter if it's 24 or if it's 18. If it's a project that you like, you'll be able to grant a waiver. Yeah, right now you're not. So then what have we done? We've we're back down to what, 15%? But so would you, I guess it's would you rather have nothing happen on South Main Street? Oh, no, not necessarily, but maybe it's not mixed use. Maybe it's just a smaller commercial building. It's the last commercial strip we have. Oh. I'd rather not have any residential there at all, but I know we need to. We need something to incentivize it. And even then, we're barely keeping up, right? And and if we get, uh, what's the minimum number of units? Is it eight units? I forget. For for affordable to kick in. Ten. Ten units. So how many seven unit developments are we going to get? And then we're just getting behind. Do you think? Because I was thinking that where we're where we're explicitly stating that first floor has to first floor and front has to be commercial that to build up they're going to need to do more than 10 20 units they're going to need to like actually do a whole project i'm hoping but like a four six town seven townhouse kind of seven unit two-story units right with the commercial space below it the back half of the commercial is the garages for the units above it. And so now we're looking at 15%, 20, maybe 20% maybe commercial. Okay. I just want to put it out there one last time. I know. I appreciate it, too. I, I would love to be able to waive anything and everything. I mean, this isn't saying you have to grant a waiver. I know, and what I'm concerned is that... It's just enabling you to, if, you, if a project that comes in that you love, it's just not quite getting there. Yeah, I'd rather have the whole board decide on something like that. You, why would you want to remove that, by the way? This is the way it's presented in the warrant. It would have to be an amendment. Yes, it would have to be an amendment. Okay. Because the more I was working through this and thinking about it and I drive down Main Street twice every day and just the more I think about it I just I, I've been thinking that like it's not like we're big I mean unfortunately because it now has would have to happen at town meeting it is drawing attention to it but it's aside from that it's not like we're drawing attention to it by saying clearly stating like we do with other waivers and other sections like that a waiver can be granted we're just kind of taking this out so that you can if you if you wanted to. I, mean, I know Robin's adamant about that 25%. Say it again? Robin. Rachel? Rachel. 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 Yeah. It's okay. Co worker with the same name. Robin's a Robin. pretty name, too. No, it's just that. Um, Rachel's adamant about that 25%. Yeah, and I mean, I think I think you all are to some degree because we've had this conversation many, many times over the course of a year almost, but I just wanted to present you with another way we could approach this if you wanted to. And if you're not amenable to it, we can, I'll just take it out. Right now I say we're not amenable to it. 
a year, maybe two down the line, if you get some projects in that the guy's going, listen, I can do it for 20, I can't do it at 25, we can revisit the, the percentage. But I hate to say, okay, you can start waiving the percentage, because once you can waive it, you can waive it down to zero. Yeah, I mean, that's correct. So basically now, that's what we got. We can call the bluff of any developer that says they can't get there, can't get the 25 mm -hmm. by saying, well, you need to go for a variance. Right. And then when they redesign the project and somehow they're at 25 because they don't want to go through the variance process, or, like or not, or they're going to get the variance because there really is no other way they, they see to make it work. Which would actually show them the hardship because they can't make it financially. It works. Right. But then why is the project... They shouldn't be able to get a variance for that because the project does not have to be built. There's no overwhelming reason why the project has to be built just because it can't meet all of That will be for the zoning board to decide. Yes. Well, then they need to understand the intent is to maintain that commercial corridor and not to start chipping away at it because if we get, I don't know how many projects, how many, I don't know how many commercial properties there are there right now, but let's say there's 20, right? And and we start chipping away at each of them, you know, 20%, 18%, 20%. How, what percentage have we gotten rid of? You know, we've lost, I don't know, 30% of our commercial corridor. Okay. That's fine. I'll take it out. To move on to the next one. I like it. I just wish there was better control, and certainly I wish there was a better way to defend it in town meeting. No one's going to be there. Tony's the only town meeting member. <coughs> Rachel won't have her say there, like she does. Is there. Rachel not a town meeting member anymore? I don't think so. I don't know. Um, and you're thinking you might not be there. I'm not, town, be there. I'm not a town meeting member. But you can come, especially if you have to present something. Yeah, I don't know if I can make that date. Okay. So Article 16 is inter I can't, I'm like out of it. Integrally, or intricately related to Article 15. Um, Article 16 is an amendment to Section 6, intensity regulations. Um, there are, again, three types of changes. I like the number three. Um, so we have two changes that are related to mixed use, which are one, we're adding mixed use to the table of dimensional controls and establishing the controls. And then two, we're aligning the language of section six with the language of section five that we just went over. And then there's a third type of change, which is not related to mixed use, and that's clarification to other language in section six. So. Here we are adding mixed use to the table and establishing the controls. And here controls is highlighted and then these are these are the controls in the table. And controls for mixed use, this is a very important point that I'm going to make. The controls for the mixed use match what is allowed for hotel or motel currently in the bylaw with the exception of the zero foot front yard setback in business A. So basically what we're doing, we're not doing anything that's more egregious or more will inf infringe on abutting properties any more than something that's currently allowed. Um, You're going to get some questions on that zero front yard. Right. Yes. Um, and front yard setbacks I can answer questions about all day. No, I mean, how are you going to so. landscape the street? How are you going to streetscape it? How yeah. gonna, where are the trees going to go? write that down and I'll come up with a really eloquent way of answering that question. More eloquent than I can do right now. Um. Yeah, half of that is the entire building doesn't have to have zero. You can have the main entrance at zero with a landscaping on, on the sides. Keep going. You get 15 well, more minutes so and then you can go home. doesn't have to be a zero foot. No. It doesn't have to be a 
It doesn't yeah. have to be zero feet, and the entire building doesn't have to be at zero feet. Right. In some cases, it's required it's still feet. front yard, zero feet. Required. required setback, zero feet, but it could be 10 feet. It could be more. Why? It says required is zero. It's saying it has to be at least, right? So usually, so we don't say min or max here, but like in business C, 10 feet is required, but they could do 15 or 20. Okay. All right. right? Yep. You're right. Okay, and then secondly, we're aligning the language with, of Section 6 with the language of Section 5. So there's just a few examples, so I just put them all in here. In 624 gross floor area, we, um, I capitalize multifamily dwelling so that it's like a, it's a defined, it is a defined um, use. Um, and then to be able to better distinguish it from a mixed-use project. And then I added in 6243, which is a provision that matches exactly the text of section 5682A, which talks about the 25% gross floor area being dedicated. That's your waiver in that other one. If you sure. included it in the waiver in the other one, would you have to revise this? Say it, um, if you had included 5682 or whatever. No, because we allow you to waive any provisions of section 6 or the table of 63. Okay. So I think we'd be okay. Um, and this says 5682A. I think it's B that's the one that's... No, it's A. No, it's B that's the waiver. No? Oh, never mind. Okay. Wait, what am I missing? I don't know what your question is. That matches the text of 5682A, which is what Right, you but want. then he's talking about if we allowed a waiver from 568. We have continued down that path of allowing waivers within those commercial. Would we also have to mention it here? Yeah. I don't think so. And my initial thinking is no, right. but we'd have to check that. But we'd have to check that yeah. shall be not less than. Right. Okay. So the reason for the change here is to clarify that, that a multifamily dwelling and a mixed-use project are not subject to the same regulations. Um, so if anyone asks about that, it's simply because we want to keep the current provisions for multifamily the way they are um, because we do not intend for, we don't intend to change them, but we also don't intend for, to make it any easier to develop a, a solely residential project on South Main Street. And another section is the landscape area. Again, it's a very similar type of change where we define, we, we capitalize multifamily dwelling and then we state that it's not part of, the, what's referred to here is a multifamily dwelling that's not part of a mixed use project because they're not regulated the same way. Why did we say that in some areas but not all? What do you mean? Like the one below, you didn't say that. Simply well, it's because, apartment 80, yeah, it's not okay. the right zoning. So here it's because it's, it includes mm -hmm. business A. Gotcha. So it's not the right zoning. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> Keep me on my toes. All right, so, um, and then buildings per lot, we added in business A because we say in mixed use that it can be one building or many buildings. So important to be consistent. And I made a note that it matches the text of section 568. And then another one. The footnotes in the table of uses, um, sorry, table of dimensional controls, there's footnote one ha has the same multifamily dwelling. And then footnote four um, talks about the zero setback from both streets on a corner lot. So that's changed to match the text in 568. And then other language that we clarified in section six, um, there's a, a general statement at the very beginning of the intensity regulations. Um, and then there's lot shape. There's two sections where we modify lot shape to say, unless said frontage is on a cul-de-sac fold. And that's it, that's all. So really, section six is a little more nitpicky. This is like the real meat of it is the the dimensional controls. So if Article 15 does not pass, should we immediately table Article 16? Yeah, probably. There are some things in it that could be good to change, like the last things here. Um, 
I think changing it, but it's not pulling everything it. else out. It's not worth it. Not worth it. No. Like they've been, they were always advertised as being part of the same article. Yeah. So like separating them out. Yeah, it's just it would just be messy. I think. Right. I agree. So. Thank you for the feedback. If you think of anything else, let me know. I'm going to finalize them tomorrow and get them to the town manager. Um, what's next? Straight up. Sorry, go back. Did you get anything out of your form based form code? Not, not a lot. Um, so it was advertised as like form based codes for small towns or something, but then the towns that they focused on were like small towns with a lot of land, like Ayer and. Um, I meant to bring my notes. There were two others. And then there was one that, oh, Somerville, which yep. is like not really a small town. <laughs> um, so it wasn't, there wasn't necessarily like direct applicability. And then I was kind of wondering like to what extent lot size matters. I was also wondering what areas of town you were thinking about form based code for. Um, well, I mean that was one of George's big things, you know, form based codes are coming, are they an answer? And I don't have a good grasp on them yet because I don't understand how you separate uses still. Right? So well, one thing that I think will be tricky in this town is like basically it's it's form over function, right? So that's what form based code is. So it really prioritizes like the way something looks and feels and the massing and scale and how it relates to the neighborhood versus like what the actual use is. And so I think that that might be a hard sell in some cases to, to just kind of be like, you don't disregard uses altogether because you do have them, but you simplify them greatly and you get everyone on board to approve a form a form that they like for something without knowing what the use might be. And I think that's tricky. Well, that's what I was getting at. I, I'm not quite yeah. sure how they work or if they work. I don't know how you do that. Because you could decorate a box and then put some incompatible use adjacent to a residential neighborhood and then, then what? So I think where it works best is with like a large redevelopment site. And I, I'm thinking about like Northern Virginia, you know, where yeah, you have exactly. like all those town village centers and yeah. in New Jersey They're all over the place too. like where you have this huge tract and you can kind of Create zoning for it right. all at once So you, you figure out what the form of this really socially engineered place is gonna be and then you have like a basic list of uses that can go in there exactly. and business gets booming and um, lots of big-box retailers come in or franchises or just come in and fold space and that's kind of where I think like maybe that would work but I don't know that it would work in Reading necessarily but there were like Ayer is doing it right. and I forget what the other town with land, lots of land um, that they were talking about. Rotten maybe. Okay. I mean so I just threw it out there because we're, we're talking about modernizing the code and so all we were really doing was starting to reword some things. I didn't know we were really doing something significant, and that's a big change. Right. So. And then so, and then our area is like, so right now we're talking about, you know, a redevelopment strategy for the Eastern Gateway, specifically the, that y the yard section where RMLD and DPW are, but like the whole concept behind what we're working on there is like we're working with the existing uses and existing buildings and trying to mm -hmm. like in incremental changes over time that like maintain like some of the really long-standing viable businesses that we have in town and just kind of make them funkier expose their more gritty side to the public so we're not talking about like a overhaul where we're raising the buildings and designing right. something brand new from scratch there and then we have South Main Street which is like, it would be hard to envision a form-based code really along, like, a corridor like that, I think. But maybe I'm just not thinking out of the box enough. I would agree in 
a commercial corridor that it wouldn't work unless you had a certain design in mind and air it worked because they want their giant CVS to look like a giant house. I don't know that we want that right, on South right. Main Street. So. Right. Yeah. So. Okay. Let's not sure. Talk about what you have here. Okay. So, we kind of started digging in. We got some feedback from a couple of you, so thank you. Um, we started digging in on where we left off after the last meeting. Um, and we looked into some what some other towns do with like how they group their uses. Um, so in your packet you have the food for thought kind of summary of what we did. Um, a track changes version of definitions where Andrew inserted some comments and some ideas. We have use regulations where I recategorized everything um, and I didn't put it in track changes because that would have been crazy. Um, so the highlights are still the same where um, they're, and they're, the legend is still the same as last time but I relocated like all the uses and I put in some new category headings. Um, and then we, you have a printout of the existing table of uses so that you can compare side by side if you want. Um, and the, a document that looks like notes like this, which is feedback provided by Tony, which I didn't incorporate because it was a little, thought we got it a little bit later in the day. Um, so that's all the stuff for uses and definitions. Um, okay, so going back to where I was. We looked at Arlington, Burlington, Concord, Salem, Somerville, and Lowell primarily to see like how they categorize their uses and um, actually found that we preferred the way Arlington did it because they have some, we liked their category headings and then they also recently recodified their zoning bylaws so it's, it is more up to date than some of the others that we looked at. Um, and then their land use pattern is similar to Redding's. Um, so I thought it had the most correlation so that's the one that I used, um, and I we have it, and we can pull it up on the screen. But um, I more or less tried to fit like our uses kind of into their framework. And I so when you look at the use regulations track changes version of all the colors, um, and you see specifically pages two and three, there's like a bunch of new headings. Those are, in large part, based off of the way Arlington categorizes their uses. Um, well, what do we know about the success of that change? 2018, you said they categorized, they, they recodified? Right. Well, so I guess it depends. Their, their own success would depend on whatever kind of regulations they have, right? So, like, however they define change of use or whatever their triggers are for site plan review and special permits and... Um, and that's not something that I, I know, actually, um, off the top of my head. So here's a question for you. Let's say we go with this new format. And I'm not necessarily opposed to anything, really, at this point. Um, what constitutes a change of use? Um, so the old one to the new one. The definition of change of use, it's from one line to another. So from civic or private club to commercial amusements. But to trigger site plan review, it is change of use category. Yeah, which, which is I the think bold heading. is which more. Is our bold, which is, it's our yes. bold heading, but now yeah. those are different. Right, so, so under considerations and reorganizing, there are a couple different ways that the bylaw looks at change of use, like Andrew just said. So. Um, we define change of use like right now mm -hmm. as one switching from one line to another line. So literally any change of use even within the same category. But 
we don't necessarily use that definition for anything. We have a trigger for site plan review that talks about a change of use being from one use category to another. And that's, that would, that's what triggers like a review by you guys. So with regard to that, that has more implications. Our changes have more implications for that than they do for the way that we define change of use. Um, so I would say we, that's something we need to talk about. Like, do you want every single, like, when, when I broke these out um, into the different categories, I was thinking, oh, some of these categories could probably be collapsed because the externalities are, are similar. Because I think what we, where we landed last time was we really want to break uses out based on what their externalities, their potential expected externalities would be to abutting uses and property owners. Um, and to some degree that can be done by like what their natural categories are and then to another degree um, like there are certain categories that probably could be recombined now that we've sorted them and we can actually get a gra get a grasp on like what what it is we're talking about we might be able to be recombined because their externalities are, are not that bad or are similar to each other um, but I, I will say like in the food for thought document under number two um, when I was recategorizing the uses. There were a few things that like started to jump off the page at me, um, and they're listed here. There are four Roman numerals. Um, I noticed that we have a lot of overlap in uses and the way they're, the ways they're defined. Um, that we have duplicates of some of the uses, but they have like they're, where they're listed twice, but they have different regulations, so that's confusing. Um, we have many uses for specific types of activity, like we have many different automotive uses or uses related to animals, but then we have no mention of like a lot of other uses, like dry cleaners, salons, things like that, and maybe that's because they get lumped into a broader category, and that gets to my next point, which is that we have a, a lot of broad, kind of all-inclusive use uses and then we have like a few very specific ones so there's like, like big categories and then specific uses and there's a big gap in the middle and there's, so there's like there are a lot of things that probably could be worked out with this exercise I would add the same to definitions a lot of definitions overlap place of assembly commercial amusement indoor recreation all get to the same thing, retail services, consumer retail establishment, professional services, and retail store, and so on. A lot of definitions are very similar as well. Right, that's right. So in some cases it could be because they're poorly defined and like they really shouldn't be overlapping that much, or we maybe can get rid of one and capture it in another. Um, but I think we should talk about whether we want to focus on broad categories and have our bylaw kind of have broad categories in the table and then the definitions have like s explicit examples like, you know, such and such use, such and such, including but not limited to th these following things. So people get an idea of what we mean by that category. Can we do that in definition? Yeah, you can oh, do can that. Can we do that legally? Mm -hmm. yeah, can, yeah, we can no do council that. council will let us do that. Sorry, Town Council we can do it now. Do there's a, there's some definitions that talk that, mm -hmm. that list explicit things. Northampton um, is a big example for that. The use table is very broad, but their definitions include a lot of the services that you would find. So, okay. or so I, I see this as like two two ways we can do it. So one, we can kind of collapse these into like broader, overarching uses that. It, Include examples, or we can have a bylaw that like has 250 different types of uses listed. Um, and right now, it's kind of leaning more towards broad categories. Like we have, for example, office. We just say office. Um, 
which could be biotech. Or there, and there are so many things that that could be. Um, and we have professional services. That's another one. Um, consumer service retail establishment. Is it like, and when you look at that, it's, it's not immediately clear to me like what that means unless I look it up. Um, well, well, let me you help you. We created the office category. It was part of business and service uses in our existing. No, I'm saying there's an actual line for an office use. I'm not talking about the category. I'm talking about the use. I lean more towards the broad categories in the table, and then we can do what we need to in the definitions. The advantage of broad categories is when something pops up that you couldn't have thought of four years before. Right. Let's exactly. say, I don't know, vaping establishments. Right, right. You've right. got something in, in there that you can apply to, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, well, it's not explicitly excluded, so you know, you gotta let me do it. Mm -hmm. Holistic medicine. Right, I mean, there are always things we're not, right. we okay. don't have crystal, a crystal ball. We can't put um, in, or always put in VR gaming station when you don't know what that is, but it may come up. Right. Five years from Or now. even escape rooms. Where right. were escape rooms four years ago? Right. Nobody exactly. knew what it was. Right. And we do spend, you know, some time, like, in town, like, f trying to figure out, like, oh, it's a use we've never really dealt with. Like, how does it fit into our bylaw? Mm -hmm. um, we where do would, have a special... Where would tarot card reading fall into? Probably professional services. Yeah. Probably. But, like, so in that regard, yeah, we would exactly. want to, like, right. maybe... Fine-tune our definition of professional services. And we services. do have a clause for use substantially similar to where if we want the permitting process, they need a special permit by the zoning board to go for that. Right. Yeah, but does it fall into professional services or recreation? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so and that's where like having definitions that don't overlap so mm -hmm. much like will help guide us, you know, mm -hmm. so like a lot of our definitions overlap a ton, and and I, that's something that we noticed when we were trying to categorize, like, well, this could go here, this, or it could go here. But you don't want to be tweaking this document every six months. Definitely not. Right. Because there are some some things that fall into a category, but we hasn't been invented yet. Right. right. You know. So, I mean, I lean towards broader categories myself. Um, because I don't think there's any possible way we could capture every yeah, like if we great. were to decide to do specifics like there are a lot of things we have now in town and that that really aren't contemplated well in this that we would want to add so but they could probably get lumped into a broader category that we might already have um, so that would be where the way I would lean um, Bill's table of uses was crazy. It's 60 pages of laundromat, less than 2,500 square feet, 2,500 square feet, or more than 2,500 square feet. Retail store, less than 25, blah, 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 blah. And so on. there's 60 pages, and I don't think we want that. But. Well, we don't have like enough commercial areas in town probably to justify All of that. doing it that right. way. But I do like sizing for at least small versus large it was helpful because they did have smaller ones by right but larger would need special permits so right. it's just something to think about well i think in that we could get we could get at that with our zoning districts right mm -hmm. so like it doesn't necessarily have to be a size it could be laundromat and business b requires a special permit versus laundromat and Industrial, maybe wouldn't, or something like that, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And then it would be nice if that footnote that said special permit <coughs> said something for size because the impacts are different significantly, say for a laundromat. Then what? A small one versus a large one. Okay. The amount of traffic, the amount of utility use, right? Well, you could have a uh, dry cleaning facility that does commercial dry cleaning. That's say fifty thousand square feet versus a smaller one that's three, four thousand square yeah, feet. Yeah, big industrial washers. But are we concerned that, that that that's gonna be a reality? Like I just threw laundromat out no. there as an example. We actually don't even have laundromat in our file, <laughs> in our table anywhere. Um, I guess I would like what are we trying to protect against is one question. Like, oh. What are we really concerned about? I will yes. go back to the gamble presentation from two weeks ago. 
where they're saying, you know, corridors, and you can have these interesting businesses, but most of it isn't even allowed under zoning. So I, I'm looking more for a certain flexibility within reason. You know, maybe having a small neighborhood store in a residential area might make sense as long as it's a small store, not a, a huge 7-Eleven, but maybe <coughs> When I was a kid, we had uh, a little Oscars. The, the entire store, including the back room, was smaller than this room. And it was great. You could go get a couple of things of milk. You could go get the candy. It was a place to, for kids basically to walk in the neighborhood and to go. Maybe that's something that would be useful and allowed in some neighborhoods. The tra you know, they're open seven to seven. There's not a huge amount of traffic. It's not like 50,000 people driving in. I'm just thinking about it. It's like that a neighborhood way. commercial. Like people are largely walking there to pick up like right. a tomato or milk Eggs. or a, yeah, or yeah. a candy bar. Or beer. And a beer. <laughs> yeah. um, Hopefully. No, but it's true. Like a small artisan baker right. in the, the Gold Street mm -hmm. front end there versus someone who's producing baked goods for other yeah. Different. Right, and those are in, like those. I, I think our land use patterns kind of dictate that those would end up in different districts. Right. Today. Today. Well, there are traffic requirements, right? Um, it's like the bagel shop. And well, it's like it's really just like availability of land area and mm -hmm. space, right. and, and I'm not super concerned that a you know large scale bakery facility is going to open on Gould Street in 2,500 square feet, they might have, that maybe they would have a bakery that gets a supply from the, you know, like mm -hmm. the one in Woburn or whatever, or the Iggy's in Somerville, and then they, that's more of a retail interface. I, I don't I'm know. hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Stop talking about food and you need to go tired so let's keep moving. I'm not tired I just have this like stupid cold that appeared this morning. <laughs> Probably co-workers got you sick. No I, I have a child although I can't really blame because it's my husband. <laughs> so anyway. Um. Uh, I'm open to any of these changes really but you know we'd have to run through them and consider them and see where, where we might want to have some guidance if there's a special permit required you know, for that authority. So whether it's us or whether it's zoning, you know, why is it special permit? What is it we were concerned about? Well, then also keep in mind that like when it is broken down more into different categories right now, like any change of use from one category to another would, would require a site plan review. Category um, meaning the bold. Yes. Category meaning the bold, yeah. So, so like you will, like I would, I would actually caution that you might end up with more review than you really want, mm -hmm. than less, because of, because of this. Um, so that's something we'll have to fine tune and to kind of try to find the happy medium for. Uh, more review that moves quickly isn't necessarily bad. You know, we get bogged down with simple, stupid storefront changes, you know, because it just happens to be jumping category. Right, right. That's a problem for everyone. Right. So there's sense. so there's two things related to that. Um, I'd have to look at the change of use. Um, you might think about like minor site plan review. Because um, you don't want to get bogged down, but we also don't want to have a chilling effect on businesses that want to look at it. Right, and that's what I'm getting at. It's like, I'm okay with these changes. Right. And now we look at it and say, okay, well, jumping from this category to this category, is that worthy of a site plan review, a minor site plan review, and right. what would the limit be on that? Right. Um, right now we've got like a 500 square foot change or something on the storefront or anything on the storefront in certain businesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, um, I think if you had specific examples of, of in the last few years, 
sites that changed use that you felt like you were the last to know and you would have liked to review it because of a potential externality or you know if you can think of those things and we can try to capture that for the future yeah. but if that's really not happening you don't feel like things are slipping through the cracks, then maybe we don't need to... The only one I can think of that might have slipped through the cracks was Remax. I thought that was a restaurant before it became a uh, real estate office. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Huang's Remax? Yeah, Remax. it was. It was the Chinese restaurant. Yeah. Right. Oh, I thought that, right that would have been a change of use category. Right. Right, and do you feel like you would have wanted, because there's no. there's no real site associated with that building. That doesn't mean there can't be externalities for right. use, but they didn't make <clears throat> any changes to the site. Right. Yeah. So then it's really like, is what's going on in that space like going to be impactful to the abutting properties in a different mm -hmm. way than what was there before? No, and is it gonna generate like more less traffic? It's less impactful, it's less and, traffic, right. it's less everything. It's unfortunate because you know, whether you like to eat there or not, it was a better, And my point was that's the only change of use I can think of that may have slipped through the cracks. And even though it slipped through the cracks, it wasn't mm -hmm. impactful for everybody else. It was a simple change. Right. And so changes like that, you want to be careful mm -hmm. not to trigger site plan review. Right. Which could be conceived as a waste of your time and a waste of the applicant's mm -hmm. time. Or have it as a have the review as a waiver so they would come to you you would present it and we would either say waive it or don't yeah, that, yeah that's so also that's, a way to do it right mm -hmm. um we might want to do that for the ones we really can't get our heads around yeah this is a simple one right yeah and the, the, the example of the restaurant to the remax thing i don't think anybody wanted to review it they weren't changing anything on the storefront right you know, less impact all around right but Maybe one we can't get our head around. You, know, you throw the waiver piece in. Well, and then there is another one that comes to mind, which wouldn't have come to you, but like the Raspberry Beret to the your CBD store, mm -hmm. because that ended up having like, look, we have a zoning by on the table now, because of that. But um. But technically, that was retail to retail. It's right, and so right. that wouldn't mm -hmm. have. That wouldn't have come. Yeah. That so wouldn't have come to you. So. Raise the dollar store. So these are all the mm -hmm. things that. Mm -hmm. Are, are interesting and are happening around town and some of them don't come to you regardless and some of them could have come to you but you probably wouldn't have cared so <clears throat> just things to think about mm -hmm. um, the butcher shop is now a computer services data, that's even data, the right data, way to analytics. describe it and data and analytics yeah. business I mean, uh, Haven Street restaurants and all of that sort of slowly converted over to right and Right. And yeah, the, the medical use is down on Haven Street. Um, and that one. So what I was getting so at with that was that we, we saw those, we ended up allowing them, but um, not being allowed by right or, or the site plan trigger rather, might deter a, um, an owner from simply giving the space away without looking for, say, the same making an effort to look for a restaurant that was in a restaurant space, as opposed to just taking the first suitor that comes in and says, I just want to put my office in there. Yeah. Well, the site plan involved is going to take, you know, six months to get through or something. Right. Maybe That's start true. Look, look for restaurants right. for a couple of times. True. Do you think that they're savvy like that? They're looking for the easiest route if they're getting the same rent. I just don't get the sense that people are aware of this. Most of the time when I talk to them. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the restaurant or an office that we wouldn't have seen, regardless. Yeah, I mean, I don't know to what extent, like, the real, the brokers and, and property owners are even aware that, that we have rules. Maybe our um, building department. We're usually the first people, like, to inform them that there are rules. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> interesting. Interesting thought. And unfortunately, going from retail to restaurant, it's far more impactful for the 
property owner than going the other way. Depending on who is incurring the cost of the build out. Well, you no know, traffic, parking, those kind of effects. Yeah. Okay. So while you might like the restaurant because it brings in more traffic, you know, somebody's got to put in the grease trap, you got to put in the. Right. Yeah. The fit out yeah. is. Fit out is. The yeah. landlord's going to kick to. in there to, yeah. uh, you know, their, their amount for tenant improvements just to track them in, but yeah. they're not going to pick up the whole cost. No. Right. Um, so, so what do you think? Um, what would you like to do for next steps? Do you want to take a look at, should we try to talk about this again with the full board? I want to look at this in detail. I want to <coughs> so compare them and see what I'm seeing as a okay. as a difference, okay. whether there's some better granularity in this one. So what if we will? Why don't we leave it the way it is, the way you're looking at it right now? You guys can look at it. We'll continue to think about it. We talk about these things every day, um, and then we'll talk about these things again when John and Rachel are able to join us um, and try to talk about how to go forward. Um, be sure to also look at the definitions and the feedback that Andrew provided. In the definitions. And then we can dig into your feedback, Tony, mm -hmm. okay. as well. We'll take a look at that. Um, awesome. Nine is nine already. Mm. Do you want to talk about the sign regulations? One comment made, and I don't know where it is now, about allowing for the underlying overlay districts to apply to signage. Yeah. The purpose for the underlying district was to kind of get a a conversation going, a little give and take. You can do some things, and you can't do the other. Uh, the PUDI, I want to say, underlining signage allowance, is basically anything the board approves. Right. So this is by thinking about that. And I had responded to your comment, which was a good comment. Um, not entirely surprising comment. Um, let me just find it. There it was. Okay, so on page 12, what Tony's talking about is under master signage plan, where I added, and you can see it in red on underlined, um, I added a provision basically to allow a property that was developed with base zoning maybe prior to the existence of an overlay to apply for a master signage plan and to be able to use the sign provisions that are allowed in the overlay district. And that, in my way, I can see both, I have, I'm not married to either way of dealing with this, but what I was thinking in that regard is that it would help bring that building a little bit more into conformity with what's allowed in surrounding that building or other buildings in that area, or, um, you know, bring it more into conformity with like what's allowed for other buildings that may have been developed under the overlay district regulations. Um, but I'm not. Yeah, I, I guess I always thought that the overlay districts were more thoughtful. Is there one you can think of that is? Well, the PUDI, yes, is more thoughtful. Um, they can do a little bit more in exchange for better landscaping, uh, better traffic, and so forth. Are you talking with 
Are you speaking with regards to signage, though? I'm or speaking just in general to, for the PUDI? In general for the PUDI. And then one of the benefits was also that they could have additional signage that's not allowed in the standard industrial district, which is why there's a very large billboard on the side of Jordan's. On the highway side. On the highway side, yes. But even so, that billboard would not be allowed on any other building in town. But it was allowed because one of the signage rules for PUDI is basically the board can grant anything they want for a signage. Yeah. Right, so I'm not saying that, that you would necessarily grant anything you wanted. I'm saying, I mean, they would have to go yeah. through the master signage <clears throat> permit process with you guys. So, um, the bill roads, uh, bill boards are not allowed anymore, so I don't know that you could even allow that. I think on the PUDI. Maybe. PUDI, I have it right here. The PUDI sign regulations are pretty flexible. Yeah. Um, I imagine that that billboard can only be on the highway side. I would imagine that that was, I wasn't involved and in that one, but that was a big piece of what they wanted. When they, they did want it on the highway side. Yeah. But there was, there's nothing to stop it from being placed anywhere other than the board's decision. Yeah, which they would never let happen on the non-highway side. Once again, you say this board, no, future I boards. Would, would, because if we don't allow billboards in town, yeah. I would think that that's an overriding uh, criteria. I guess Tony's point is that if you, you're taking advantage of an overlay without without conceding any of the, the benefits that we wanted from the overlay, but I really do, I'm really on Julie's side that the master signage plan is probably going to come up with a better overall approach to signage. Or maybe a little more oversight or maybe a little more control, right? We get back and forth. Because between it seems like yeah. there is a gap, like between what you can do in base zoning signage and what you could do if you were an overlay, you know, development. Just direct. There's kind of a gap. Oh, there, there's somewhere. a huge gap between that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm trying to kind of like solve that impasse a little bit by like I'm not saying like give away the store, let them do everything here that's in this PUDI. And, and without any kind of process, I guess. Yeah, I would think that the limits, that there would be limits on what they would be allowed to say do there. Right. Right. So, I mean, maybe, maybe the language I put in here is, is needs to be strengthened to say that, but. Like, if you're worried, especially, like, the future boards might um, allow a lot more than you think you would. Um, I, my concern is not about this board, whoever sits on it. It's more about what the Board of Appeals would allow. They might interpret that as saying you can max it out to, well, you know, a PUDI can do it. But so in this case, right, they yeah. wouldn't have to go to the Board of Appeals. No, but they might. Well, unless, let, let me finish, unless they applied to you for a master signage plan and you denied it, or under current regulations where it's not allowed so, and they want to do it, so they have to go to the zoning board. So the zoning board right now is armed with not a lot. They're, they're only armed with what's in the bylaw. But in, in the future, they would be armed with a master signage plan that had been denied by this board, and they could see the reasons and they could see why. Um, however, there was something in here. So actually, I was just remembering this. Let me clarify 
that we have on page 14, a statement in the bylaw signed by law that says that a decision on a certificate of appropriateness can be appealed to the select board. So, typically you would be issuing a certificate of appropri appropriateness for a master signage plan. So I would see that as, maybe this wouldn't go to the zoning board at all, <laughs> the way it's currently worded. Um, you might want to check with the select board to see if they want to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it seems like that would want to be the zoning board. Right. Um, How often do they meet? Zoning board? Mm -hmm. Twice a month. Okay. Unless they don't have anything on their yeah, the select board. Twice a month. Twice. And you guys okay. used to meet twice a month, but now you only meet once a month. It I all think. depends on what, how much. Because we're so effective and efficient. <laughs> <laughs> and no one complains. Like, no applicants complain. So, it works out. And try and be very table of use, that's why. I guess I could be talked into allowing for signs higher up on buildings, which I'm trying to prevent, uh, on certain conditions. I was looking at 560 Main Street, where they have the signs up the top where they're not supposed to be. But they aren't, they aren't that bad. They aren't, I don't think they're lit. So they're not. Which one's that? Um, Christopher's. Christopher's Ron, uh, Aganis. The, Aganis. The, the J. Michael Salon. Okay, but they came in for those. Yeah. Well, the master signs. Right? Well, because they're in business B, <coughs> they need to be, um, they also need to be approved. But they have the master signs plan so they can do things. All right, that explains a lot. But those are nice. They're not lit. They're not ostentatious. They're not extremely large to compensate for the height. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the biggest fear I have is, yeah, I'd like to put it up, say, four at the top of the 14th story. Well, it's got to be 30 feet high because I need to be able to see that that far away. It's like, well, then put it down lower and make it smaller signs so people can see it. So I think that, like, even two things. In the signage requirements for PUDI, you know, one of the things they talk about is illumination between certain mm -hmm. hours. And then, you know, through the master signage plan process, those things would all definitely be worked out mm -hmm. as conditions um, on the master signage plan. Yeah. So, <sighs> and this does allow PUDI signage regulations do allow um, a sign to extend to the lowest point of the main roof line but not above the roof. So there are like, you know, there are, it's a little more, it's a lot more yeah. flexible, but there are limits, I guess mm -hmm. is what I'm getting at. Flags. 
decorative than otherwise? So every um, section, so I don't misspeak. But we temporary oh. signs, but oh, not temporary. Yeah, it's in temporary signs. Yeah, and governmental yeah. flags by right. And then one additional flag. Um, yeah, so it's on page nine, right before prohibited signs, right above prohibited signs. Um, in addition to flags authorized under section 83A4, um, which talks about government signs, so government flags, sorry, um, one additional flag per business shall be allowed. That flag. I don't think we have any restrictions on that. Yeah. That could be an open flag, that could be another country's flag, that could okay. be a rainbow flag. It's and it's okay. in the table as well, Pam. So okay. um, under other flag is what it's called. And it's on page 18 towards the top of the table. Um, it's considered a temporary sign. Okay. Um, no sign permit required. And then there's no re regulations, but there can only be one other flag. In addition to the state, federal, right, yeah, city flag. Yeah. Okay. So if a store had, uh, they, they could change it. Every well, week, the every flag day. of Ireland outside of a pub. Yeah, yes, they that's fine. Yeah, right. They want to put up a, a, a spring flag or, or Easter flag or. Yeah. Mm -hmm. flag, right. Well, I was thinking about um, not the Union Jack, but uh, rebel flag or Confederate flag. And technically, flags, just like any other thing that's considered a sign and are signed by law, it cannot be regulated for content. Yeah, I guess I don't know that. I don't know that we get that. <coughs> Which is partly why. We allow an other other flag, and we don't say what it can be um, because they can't really. I'm just curious. Yeah. So, signage. Should we wait till next time and go through everything point by point with the full commission? Oh, so, oh but Pam won't be here. No, I won't be. We'll be watching. You can, you can I submit. doubt it. <laughs> I want you to submit comments. <laughs> I could do that in advance. Yes, no, on please the mess. do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> these flags Stop should Stop with the neon. <laughs> not enough colors in these flags. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you will submit I'll look at it. If you have time, that would be great. Um, Are you MJ now? I, it's just, it reversed it on me. Are the only ones. <laughs> it's got to be some setting. And it used to be confusing because town council has the same initials as me. Because this person was actually J. Mm -hmm. So when it was him and I both looking at it and we were both JM, it was like extra confusing. But now it flipped mine, so it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> All depends on how you're set up. In you, told you told it to yeah. Uh, I think it, I got upgraded. Yeah. And it just happened. And does it, it go into Outlook or something like that and pull from uh, there? Well, Word, the Word. fire office, yeah. you would tell it who you are. Right. It's pulling from, it's that's pulling from there. Yeah. Outlook and the logical one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll take a look at this. Okay. Great. Not on meds. Yeah, have have on, have before meds and during meds and see how different your feedback is. <laughs> All right, so we talked last time about the downtown smart growth design guidelines, and we left it at, because um, people would take a pass at them one last time and see if they felt like we had accomplished what we set out to. The main person who needed to do that is not here tonight. My memory was Rachel. So do we handle it for the next meeting? Yeah. Did you all get a chance to look at them? I got to look at it. I, I haven't seen anything objectionable. 
Yeah, everything looked good. Yeah, I think we got there. Yeah. So, you know, I would always want more setbacks on anything and right. smart growth districts, but that's just... Right. Because you live and in I want, And I want more trees through the whole town. Yep. And I'm really serious about that one because I'm not saying... I mean, Harbor Vine just doesn't cut it in my book. Those are the, the two things. That, and there needs to be a concerted effort. I'll give them lilac plants. They can do whatever they want with those. Those, those turn out to be 20 foot trees. So we'll talk about that next time. Okay. And I think we might want to have a vote to approve at some point soon the new design guidelines yes. <coughs> and then send them to DHCD for review and approval. Yep, okay. it's time. All right. I'm not sure we're going to make much more progress on them. So, two things. We have um, the 2020 meeting schedule. I was thinking we should add a meeting at some point in late March or early April to, to have a zoning workshop. Advertise to, to discuss a lot of the things. Because a lot of the things, I mean, I think you did it last year. I wasn't here. Or this past year, you had an extra meeting that was just about zoning. Um, so early April. When's town meeting? Uh, town meeting is April 27th. <coughs> um, so I was thinking, well, we're gearing these up, most of these changes up for November. No, I just, I was just thinking about yeah. time. So I was thinking either like Monday, March 30th, or Monday, April 6th. Yeah, that's so far out for me. It, I'll say yes, but I have no idea. So if all of these dates in 2020 are really far out for you guys, with the exception of maybe January. You can put them in your calendars ASAP and never have a conflict ever again. That's just not the way Oryx does. <laughs> <laughs> these are not our priorities. Well, my job tells me, no, you need to be in Chicago on Monday. It's not at the top of your list of priorities. It's not a choice. How much you're providing? Pizza. I know, because the thing that pays you is always like, priority right <laughs> unfortunately all it takes is pizza <laughs> oh it's king donuts pizza in chicago that's not pizza that's pizza. deep dish though she's canes donuts in no, wait, chicago right. Never mind. it's its own category it's, it's its own category of pizza i'm just saying a bastardization <laughs> of what a pizza should have been it's a cheese pie with a tomato crust so I'm thinking March 30th might be a better day, because in April, if we did the 6th and 13th, that's two back-to-back -back weeks. But the 30th is kind of wedged right in there, in the middle. Okay. All right. So I will um, figure that out, send that, ar send that around. Um, what else? Yamble presentation? From any results, any good impact, any good feedback? We are still going through the feedback received at that um, meeting. I think we, we've heard a lot of positive things about it. I don't know. Have you, are you familiar with what Tony's talking about? No. Okay. So we will, it's probably easiest if they watch the video of the select board presentation, right? Right. But I don't know how much it shows his presentation. Oh, did stuff. you watch it? I don't. I don't know what it looks like. I was hoping they were really like focusing on the screen. I would hope so, but I don't know. Okay. All right. Well, let me send it. We'll figure out what to send you um, so you can familiarize with it.
Tony, you were at the. I was at the meeting. Office. John was at the meeting. Oh, mm -hmm. and John was there. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, did you have any thoughts you wanted to share? Well, no, other than John made one, one uh, very uh, insightful comment is that once you turn a lot into residential, you can never turn it back to uh, business. Just think about it. You, you broke it up and now each quarter acre is worth half a million dollars just to get three acres is going to cost you more money than it's ever going to be worth. Um, did he make that comment? He made out it to loud, me. He did not made it out loud. Because I was like, I don't remember that comment, but it is it is a good point. Um, all right, I'll share that with you guys. I know you don't have a lot of spare time, but it's pretty interesting. It's pretty good. Okay. Um, so town meeting. You saw my. Email, I hope. Next. You sent an email? It was in the email with the link to the was packet it? for today. But you missed it. It's okay. So it's supposed to open on Tuesday the 12th, and um, I think we're anticipated to have our zoning articles on the 14th, which is next Thursday. Um, town manager is anticipating just a two night town meeting unless something really gets stalled. So please let me know if you plan to be there. Um, and if you are supposed to do something but you can't make it, also let me know. Well, your email says not until the second or third night, but now you're telling us you anticipate the anticipated. Yeah, so chart. last week, that was the fear. This week, seems like maybe that's not a fear anymore. So Monday the 18th is no longer um, the feeling is it might not be needed and that we're more likely to be on Thursday the 18th. I wanted to give you is about, um, are you familiar with 5G small cell distributed antenna systems? Yes. It's okay. scary. Um, so just a quick um, overview. Basically, um, the FCC has ruled and is allowing a declaratory judgment or something that these types of cellular facilities can be located on utility poles and regulated as more of a public utility than a than through zoning um, so in essence they'd be located in like a right-of-way um, and right-of-ways generally aren't captured in zoning um, and that's how they kind of become proliferate in towns without a zoning process um, but they did give towns a certain period of time to promulgate regulations, like design regulations, for what these types of small cell antennas and poles and things can look like. And Bob Lillashore, um, town manager, um, was advised that he had the authority to just quickly establish regulations last April before the deadline for regulations passed, and so he did. Um, and so that's what we use, um, and they're, they're quite thorough, and they cover a number of different areas regarding locations and um, materials and, and height and um, all sorts of parameters. Um, and we now have our first application that's come before the town, um, and the FCC has a shot clock time period for it. So once it's a completed application, um, it can take no more than 150 days to get through town permitting, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's all kind of internal because there's not really a... They have to have a poll hearing if they put up a new poll with the select board. Right. But beyond that, there's no regulations and zoning for them. Um, so we have... They're proposed... They've proposed three sites for their polls. Um, 
one, and when we're working with them on the locations still, so they might change slightly, but one of them is down in front of the Fantasia building on South Main Street. And that one, they have to go through a state licensing process as well, because that's also actually in the state-owned right-of-way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they have one proposed up by the Ash Street, Main mm -hmm. Street intersection, so like it's McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. yeah right it's that kind of right in front of McDonald's. Um, and then a third one that they're looking to put somewhere down by the train depot. So, um, and the town actually owns a lot of the land under the depot and under that right of way. Um, so we're working with them to figure out a location and to determine whether they can maybe install it in one of the light fixtures that's already. And their function is for broadcasting? So. They allow oh, yeah. higher speeds um, and a different, um, like, kind of you, you're familiar with, like, 3G, 4G. Oh, so yeah. it's like they get better speeds, different um, bandwidths, more coverage, mm -hmm. filling in the gaps, and having the small cells kind of located closer and more frequently throughout town means, like, you'd have... Faster. So 5G is, is used you know, for <coughs> autonomous vehicles, it's know. used for smart yeah. uh, smart cities, you know, it's kind of behind a lot of those like But it's not coming. like a cell tower. No, so it's it's it not, a it's a cell I call it cell tower. It's a very, it's, yeah, right. The um, question is, which direction is the data going in? Both. Both. Just like a cell tower. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to... We are trying to work with the applicant to kind of figure out if there are ways we can get ahead of the proliferation of these things throughout town. So, like, have their poles be able to hold multiple carriers. We talked to them about lo trying to locate is it an existing dish poles. size. Is yeah. it bigger than a bread box? You talk about you can. It's a you know the mailbox. The, oh the old, sure. Old style mailbox. Like a transformer so, size. Transformers on the poles. Yeah. So. Looks like a yes. muffler. So they mm -hmm. are. They come with like little cabinets. And yeah. Little antennas, yeah, um, loopy wires and stuff. The reason they're so um, they're so close to each other, the distance is terrible. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> and I you get high speed, yeah. but they you have to be closer to them, which is why they need more of them, which is why they're micro towers. No, got it. Yeah, so you probably have a lot of like every place you have a train well knowledge about these. Yeah. <laughs> um. I can't imagine that they don't interfere with each other. That transformer doesn't. So we're looking into all sorts of things like um, we, we're having conversations with the applicant about health impacts, security, data security, um, potential conflicts with RMLD and town radio um, dispatch, and, you know, all those kind of conversations are happening. Um, but it might enhance at the same time. Yes, that's oh, correct. That. Huh? <laughs> palm tree, fake palm tree. Yeah. With the, uh, we can read, we can paint thirty name in pink again, and we can put that right next to it. Lilac, yeah. Fake lilac bush with a bunch of stuff. So we are trying to encourage like the poll to carry more than one provider, so that we don't just have like Verizon and then AT and T puts up their own, and then you know all of a sudden well, we have poles everywhere. They usually use existing poles. So. Um, Conversations have been had with RMLD about using existing poles, um, and we're told at this time that RMLD is not um, amenable to that. So they are looking to put up their own poles. Is that because they won't pay rent for them? The entity that we work with is actually specifically more of a pole company mm -hmm. that then per, that is the host for the. Okay. So we're working with Tilson Tech out of Portland, or uh, Portland, Maine, and their client is AT. And they're, they're, the reason Tilson Tech is in the picture is because AT&T approached RMLD, was told no, mm -hmm. and needed to find an, an entity that would establish a poll for them, be a host. Now that's weird, because I would have thought it'd be Verizon, because they've already got the back channel fiber in the town. That's right. But. I'm probably misspeaking. Maybe it's Verizon. Well, they also Lots create some mesh so problem. that the data just goes from pole to pole to pole. Right. So. Okay. Do you want to do minutes? Do you want us to do minutes? If you want to. 
want to. Sorry for the rambling evening. I hope no one's watching at home. <laughs> they were given to us, but online? There, yeah, we, we passed them out last time. They're still from September. Well, we didn't I have no changes. We didn't review them it. last time. Okay. flipping through them real quick, but I haven't read them in detail, and I'd rather not approve them if I haven't read them at least. I wasn't at that meeting. That's why I want to read them in detail. And the silver that was the Fusilli meeting, wasn't it? Yeah. That feels like a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of notes in here. They did the meeting, uh, the minutes? No, no. Julie. Anything specific you mm -hmm. want to draw our attention to? No, all kinds of accessory apartment changes. Yeah. Actually, a lot of special conditions for those, like they have to be on the corner live. Granted, a heck of a lot of them. Anybody who's got a in garage is turning into a farm. In other states. In other states. Like, yeah, like in single family zoning districts, they'll allow denser development, but only under certain. The headline will say that no more single family zoning, but that's not. Well, that was actually from the, um, the Gamble presentation. I was noting that it mentioned that those closest to the development would have the highest cost for the benefit to the entire town. And I said, well, there should be, speaking to John, I said that there should be some way that we can make some sort of adjustment, either increase the density for those residents who are directly impacted or abutting it so that they can, instead of having a single family home, maybe have a two-family on the lot or allow for denser zoning. Maybe even go somewhere, I don't know, maybe, you know, say like one unit per uh, X number of thousand feet. I know that in my neighborhood, most of the single-family homes are on 5,000 square foot lots. Mm -hmm. So you say you could put two or even three on a 15,000 square foot lot in the S15 district if you're abutting the mixed use some thoughts and ideas.
usually a double digit views on the YouTube videos. Yeah. It doesn't capture. But double digits is usually usually it's thirty something views. Can you watch the whole thing to the camera? Does it load? Question, what's the status of the um, Main Street repaving and road diets? Um, so, we've been meeting, a bunch of us here in Town Hall have been meeting with representatives from MassDOT um, to talk about the trial period for the road diet. So, right now, they're looking at doing a trial period for the northern section the entire length of the northern section, as well as a trial period for the entire length of the southern section. Um, so we're working out the kind of the goals of each trial period and the metrics for success and then the logistics and the timing mm -hmm. for when those will be happening and how the outreach process will go with the community. Um, and what types of data they'll gather. Like, so we can sit with them at the table and hammer out a list of data that we, points and, and intersections and side streets and things like that that we want them to look at. Um, and they will. They've indicated it's, it's a partnership, really. Um, and then we will have some real-time data about how it work, how, how the trial road diets work go from there in determining whether we think it's a the right type of thing to do here in Reading. If it really does improve safety mm -hmm. for, you know, vehicular traffic primarily, but also multimodal yeah. access to downtown. So probably next spring um, and potentially through the summer into the fall for the data collection period. Um, so basically, barring major catastrophe, we're looking at the next year, we're going to be on a road diet. I wouldn't say that. that um, I mean, it all depends. Like, when, when they pave, they have mm -hmm. to stripe. So it's like, and so paving and striping are very weather dependent. Mm -hmm. So. They're thinking that I think they're gonna. They're hoping that they can get the in, the intermediate course paved and the road striped for the road diet mm -hmm. by May, at least for the southern section. Um, but we want the full data collection, the full six week data collection, mm -hmm. to be when schools in session, yeah. which means they may need to leave it up over the summer. Mm -hmm. And then do a little more data collection in the fall. Okay. 
So that's like the piece we're kind of working out is like when and when are we messaging, when and how are we messaging it to the community and who's establishing like what the metrics for success are and what are the thresholds and yeah. what are the different data points that are going to be gathered and how also like how are they going to get the data that we want. So. Page six, the uh, one, two, three, third paragraph from the bottom. The second sentence starts, Miss Hitch. It says, Miss Hitch com commented in some point in time. I think it should be Miss Hitch commented that at some point in time. Or at some point in time. It may be a business necessity. Is that the only thing? Yeah. Uh, page seven. Several references to Mr. Hitch. <laughs> really? <laughs> Where? Oh, I see. In the motions. In the motions. There are two. I see two. Are there any others? Uh, yeah. Those are the only two I saw. Yeah, the first one says Miss. Right, and then the next two are Mr. <laughs> I miss that. Uh, motion to approve the meeting minutes from September, September 9th, 2019 as amended. Second. Second. All Too favor. slow. All in favor? Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Very productive. Do you need this original? We'll take it. Just in case. I doubt we need it. Adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? <laughs>